Hi, I'm Simon. If you've been part of the Selenium community for a while, you may know me as the person who led the Selenium project from 2009 until the very end of 2021. If not, well, it's nice to have a chance to talk to you. Given my history with the project and that this is SourceCon, I guess you're thinking I'll be talking about some new feature of Selenium itself. Instead, I'm going to be talking about some of the lessons we've learned building Selenium. They're lessons I hope you'll be able to borrow from us and use yourselves. So, without further ado, let's get stuck in. The Selenium project is a little unusual in that we have all the language bindings you know and love kept in the same repository. It's always been a mishmash of languages. The early Selenium RC builds used to keep the API in an XML document and use XSLT and language-specific build systems all wrapped together with Maven to generate the language bindings. It was complicated, and that's less than ideal. The WebDriver codebase started separately, but had a mix of Java and c -sharp from the beginning. It quickly needed C++ 2, and then Python, Ruby, and JavaScript. We started with a homegrown rake-based system called Crazy Fun, which was complicated, slow, and hard to use. We then migrated through a build tool called Buck, which was fast and hard to extend, and we're now using Bazel. Now, I can nerd out about builds all day, but for most people, the build isn't something they really want to worry about. It's just something you have to suffer through while we try and ship features, right? Maybe we should start at the beginning. Stepping all the way back, let's answer the question of what a build actually is. Regardless of your language of choice, we can think of it as a process of transforming the original source code into something we can ship to users. Be that as a binary, like the Selenium server, libraries people can depend on, or just a simple script that you can run to do something interesting. If you're using a compiled language, such as Java, Go, or Rust, one of these transformations is to invoke the compiler to generate binary outputs. For JS folks, one transformation might be concatenating all the source files based on input uh, and the import statements, and another might be tree shaking to reduce the size of the generated JS. Another kind of transformation would be to take generated outputs and to package them up into zips or jar files. If we tilt our heads and squint a little, we can even say that running test is one of those transformations. We take the test code, transform it into a series of passes and failures. So you can imagine your build being composed of a series of boxes, each of which take in some inputs, which transform them into one or more outputs. In computer science, we typically call these boxes functions. When there's a guarantee that the same inputs will produce the same output, we have something called a pure function. These are really useful in builds, because if we know that the same inputs would produce the same output, we can cache the result and skip the expensive and messy bit of doing actual work and just use the same value we created last time. And in fact, that's just what all the major build system, uh, systems I'm aware of do, though with varying degrees of success. Why aren't they all completely successful? There are three reasons. Firstly, some inputs may be implicit, and these might have changed between each build. Secondly, maybe we haven't been able to properly tell whether or not an input has changed. And third, and finally, perhaps the function lied and doesn't actually return the same result for the same inputs. So let's tackle the first problem first. Let's take the case of using npm to compile some TypeScript. The obvious inputs we think about are the actual source files, but we've all run into the problem where the build works on one machine and not on another. So that can't be all there is to it, right? One reason is that tooling, such as the TypeScript compiler, is present on one machine and not on another. So the TypeScript compiler is an input, but they fix bugs between releases. So I guess the version of the compiler also matters. The version is an input too. And of course, the same applies to the version of NPM or Yarn we're using. And compilers can be affected by things like command line flags or even environment variables or the OS you're running on. Those are all inputs and there are very few build tools that enumerate them, so they're frequently implicit inputs. So, in the ideal build system, we'd have a way of listing not only the obvious, but the implicit dependencies. Another thing to bear in mind is that the outputs of one function are the inputs to another. We need to properly track what's being produced rather than just dumping it out on the disk and hoping for the best. Not tracking this stuff properly is one of the major reasons we need to run clean builds, and clean builds are incredibly wasteful if done 
and risky if they're not done. Grief. We better add to our list of things our ideal build system can do. It should track outputs. Another implicit input is when we're running our build. Try and resolve the latest version of some dependency you use, such as Selenium, and you'll get one value. Try the same thing in six months, you'll likely get another version entirely. How do we handle this? With lock files. These allow one person in one place at one time to figure out which particular set of dependencies play nicely together and write that down somewhere we can check into our source code. That means that subsequent builds don't need to take the time to do the same dependency resolution, meaning a faster build, and you've also removed the importance of the exact time and date when the build has been run. This is such a good idea that almost all modern build systems have some mechanism for creating, sharing and using lock files. Clearly, in the ideal build system, we'd be able to use lock files too. Once we've nailed down implicit inputs, our second problem is we need to be able to tell whether an input has actually changed or not. One common way to do this is to take a look at when the input was last modified, it's m time. If that's later than the last time a particular output was generated from it, then clearly it's dirty and we should regenerate the output. That's the way that make, maven and gradle all work, by looking at the m time. This isn't a great way to do things though. It's all too easy to get the modified timestamps out of line with the derived outputs, causing us to either under or over build. Either way, it's not great. What else could we do? Well, the thing that really matters is what's in the input file, right? We don't actually care when they were modified, just that they've changed. The way that this problem is commonly solved is by hashing the file and using the hash to figure out if the file has changed. There are plenty of fast hashing algorithms out there, and there are ways we can avoid having to read the entire file system each time we do a build. So although this may be a bit slower than looking at the end time, the reduction in rework is enough to make this a really good way of figuring out whether something has changed. So our ideal build system will hash inputs and then uh, not rely on the modification time. And finally, we come to the last thing we'd like from our ideal build system, that for each step, the same inputs lead to the same output. Why is this something we'd like? At the simplest level, it makes caching a lot easier, meaning we need to do less work in our builds. Another answer is it provides us with a way of creating historical builds, which is useful for finding bugs. Another answer is it becomes possible to verify that the binaries in production are actually generated from the source code we believe it to be. In most cases, companies don't worry about this sort of thing, but there are cases where that's useful. And if you could have that safety for free, why not take advantage of it? Sometimes some non-determinism is unavoidable. I'm looking at UC toolchains, but most modern toolchains for most languages we care about make this possible. So while bit for bit reproducible builds are a great thing to be aiming for, if the outputs are functionally equivalent, maybe that's good enough? So our ideal build system will do its best to make sure that each step of the build is a pure function. Same inputs, exactly the same output. Now, if we know the hashes of all our inputs, and we also believe we, ha we have a build composed of pure functions, we can start doing some pretty nifty things. For a start, it's possible to store each and everything we produce in a CAS, a content addressable storage, using keys derived from the hashes of the inputs. If you're not available with content addressable storage, think of it as a giant dictionary or hash. A key points to a specific value. We can host that on some central server, and then everyone in the team who's trying to build the same thing could take advantage of the work that's already been done. Better yet, if our listing of the implicit inputs is sufficiently good, there's no reason to be constrained to just running on our local machine. Why not just have a fleet of boxes running in the cloud, each of which can reach into the shared cache, grab the inputs it needs, and then run the build steps contained in a single pure function before uploading the result into the cache again. That way, you could run hundreds of build steps at the same time and everything would go faster still. It would be nice if our ideal build system supported remote caching and distributed builds. There's something that we ran into really quickly with Selenium, but more and more people are running into it now too. Our builds are seldom just using one language. 
It's not uncommon to have a JavaScript front-end talking to back-ends written in Java, Go, or Rust. Maybe even all three. Perhaps they're using protocol buffers to define the shape of the data and the RPCs that can be used. And then, we want to be able to run these things locally, but also package them as Docker images. We need almost all these things in the Selenium project. Our repo contains code written in JavaScript, Java, Python, c -sharp, and Ruby. Each of the languages uses fragments of JavaScript compiled down to small lumps of reusable code, which we call atoms. So they all need to, uh, to consume JavaScript. The Java build features a web-based front-end written in React, and the language bindings also have code generated from the CDP definitions, which are stored as JSON. We want to be able to test by deploying the grid in a fully distributed mode to a local Kubernetes cluster. There are so many interdependencies and so much shared code between the languages that separating the repos would be a tragic waste of effort. If we relied on, build, on language specific build tools, the number of tools would be mind boggling. Weaving them all together to produce a cohesive and sensible whole would be a daunting task and one that most people would quite rightly avoid if at all possible. But you know, what if our ideal build tool could handle any language we wanted it to? If it could run Java tests with the same ease as JavaScript tests or Python ones? If it could create Python wheels, Ruby gems and Java chars? And if we're asking for ponies, I'd also like that it should be able to create Docker images or tarballs too. And it should do all this with a simple build file syntax and provide a consistent command line interface to these things. It's not so much a pony as a unicorn. There's a slew of new build tools appearing recently, but the one we settled on was Bazel. Originally, this was called Blaze and was part of Google's secret source for dealing with their massive monorepo. We picked it up in 2019, but why did we select it? It meets, a number of the, it meets many of the criteria we have for our ideal build system. It tracks inputs and outputs carefully, so we seldom need to run clean, and each build step in the build, called actions, attempts to be a pure function, and it often succeeds in being a pure function. It has a massive advantage of working for all the languages we support, although the .NET support is shaky at best. It's also something that somebody else is working on. I'd always advise using something other people are using if you have the choice. There's another reason why making the jump to Bazel was good for us. It made getting started building the project significantly less painful. Using Bazel means that there are fewer dependencies that need to be on the developer's machine. We now use pinned versions of Python, Ruby, and the JDKs used to compile the project, as well as, as, well as pinned versions of NPM and all of our third-party devs. We even have pinned versions of Firefox, Chrome, and Edge, as well as the drivers for those browsers. That means that someone new to the project doesn't need to install the entire internet to get something done. Instead, they need to install Bazelisk, which is a widely used wrapper for Bazel that allows us to pin the version of Bazel we use. They also need the .NET developer tools, the various runtime library the browsers use, but not the browsers themselves, and Python 3, which we transparently call from a script before every build. All of these things are widely understood, and better yet, there's help on Stack Overflow from a growing number of people. It took us a while to fully adopt Bazel, and members of the Selenium team have been responsible for improving many of the language-specific Bazel rule sets. It's not always been fun to get there, but we made the leap and now many of the rough, rough edges have been smoothed. All this means that getting started on the Selenium build is easier than it used to be. Now, there's just one more idea to cover before we can start looking at examples. Graphs are really useful data structures. They represent nodes that are connected to one another by lines. Think of a subway map, and you've got an idea of what a graph might look like. The kind of graph we're interested in are directed acyclic graphs. Directed means that each line connecting each node has a direction. An acyclic means that there's nowhere in the graph where, if you followed the lines and the direction they point, you'd be able to make a circle. You can imagine your build describes one of these directed acyclic graphs. Now, some build tools use a very coarse-grained build graph, but Bazel likes to have a fine-grained one. Why is that? Well, the nice thing about graphs is there are some really well-known algorithms for figuring out how to parallelize operations on each node in a graph. The finer the build graph, the better the chances parallelism can be used, and the faster our builds. Within the Selenium project, we aim for a single build file per Java package. On this slide, we can see the simplified build graph 
generated by Bazel of the dependencies of the Core Web Driver APIs. You can see that each of these has a label attached to it. These begin with a double slash, have a path, and then a colon followed by another string. What are these labels? The labels are directions on where to find the definition for a particular thing we're building, known as a target. Here's a build file for the Firefox driver. At first glance, it contains a lot of information, but if we read it slowly, it's not so bad. You can see a load of we you can see we load some definitions we'll use later in the first few lines. Think of these like import statements in your favorite language. We then create a jar for export, which is a jar we'll upload to Maven Central. This is a name, some source files, some Maven information, and a list of dependencies, which is given as a set of labels. While build files can become more complicated than this, they're basically the same throughout any Bazel project, including Selenium. A collection of these targets, each containing an exact list of the sources they need and a list of the dependencies they require. I skipped over this in the last slide, but Java export is what's known as a build rule. <coughs> to someone reading the build files, these are the smallest unit of the build. Conceptually, they take a set of inputs and convert them into a known type of output or outputs. There are loads of them for all sorts of things. Want to build a Java binary? Use a Java binary rule. Want a Go library? Then a Go library rule will help. Want to generate an output using a shell script? A gen rule is your friend. But maybe Bazel doesn't ship with the rules we need, or we have a very specific or custom need. Not to worry. Bazel rules are written in a Python-like language called Starlark, and we can write our own. Here's, one that might, here's what one might look like, and it's from the Selenium build. Don't worry too much about what it does, but the interesting thing is that each rule is composed of a series of actions. In this example, we do two things. We create a directory, and we run a shell script. So to the user, the build is composed of a series of rules that are tied together in the build files. But under the covers, the build is actually a set of actions, each of which can be executed when their inputs are ready for them. This allows Bazel to have an even more finely grained, uh, finely grained build than it otherwise would. And again, it allows us to go a little bit faster. Let's assume you've checked out the Selenium project. How does one build, for example, everything in the Java trees? And the uh, and Python trees and the Java trees at the same time? Beg your pardon. It's easy. You do it like this. Notice <clears throat> that we're building both languages at the same time with the same Bazel build command. This build is also pulling in various bits of JavaScript to make things work the way we expect them to. By the way, this is an actual build of Selenium. For me, a clean build can take about two or three minutes, but here I've partially built some stuff already, notably the React UI, so the build is a lot faster, only about 11 seconds in the end. Now, let's run all the smallest tests we have for both Python and Java. I could do the other languages, but I think this shows the uh, idea, right? It only takes about a minute to build everything and run, and you'll see there's a failing test in there. Oh. One thing that Bazel is doing here <clears throat> is automatically parallelizing the test for us, so we're using my machine as efficiently as possible. If you've keen eyes, you'll see that some of the tests have already been run. They've been cached. That's because I ran a subset of these earlier before recording the video. Bazel knows that I've not changed anything in the test passed before, so it's not running them again which is probably what you'd hope a build system would do. I don't need to know anything other than the fact there are tests to be run. Even though I'm running both Python and Java tests, the same command is used to run them. This means that anyone on the team can make a change anywhere in the tree, for example, to the shared JavaScript, and rerun all the affected tests without needing to know how to do this on a per language basis. Oh, wait a moment. All the affected tests? We already know that Bazel maintains a build graph. It also provides a query command that allows us to introspect that graph. As an example, while I was preparing this talk, I noticed that if I change the color class from the support package, loads of tests are run, and it's not obvious why. Let's ask Bazel and see if it can help. First of all, we want to get a list of all the tests that could be run if the color class changed. Mm -hmm. Then we want to pick one of those tests and find out the path between that and the color class. I don't know about you, but I find reading this kind of information as plain text quite hard. So let's also generate an image with the graph in so we can actually see the, the, the reason. I know that went quite fast, but the idea I'm trying to get across here is that Bazel allows us to easily introspect the build graph. And this opens up all sorts of interesting possibilities for us. Don't worry if you miss the details, as long as you have the idea. Oh, and by the way, 
We can see here why the virtual authenticator test depends on the color class. It's because it goes through the drivers package and the support package and, and it's needed by the test. That'll explain it. In the Selenium project, we've learnt into the basal way of having fine-grained build targets. As you've seen, one benefit of this is that when we make a change, Bazel uh, doesn't need to rerun everything because tests are just build actions and those are treated as pure functions. The test results are cached. That means that only those tests that actually need to be rerun are rerun. I've seen several engineering organizations and projects sink significant resources into figuring out how to do this kind of minimal test running. It's always been remarkably difficult, particularly a multi-module project. And suddenly, Bazel has made this a non-issue. It's a lovely way to live life. However, when someone, frequently me, checks in something that causes one set of the Selenium bindings to fail to compile, that shouldn't block PRs or changes that touch unrelated parts of the build from landing successfully. How do we resolve this? Once again, we can lean into the fact that Bazel can figure out which targets depend on which files. And once we know that, we can figure out which tests need to be rerun. This process of going from a list of changed, added and deleted files to the set of targets to run is called target determination. In the Selenium project, we use a simple script that we lifted from the Bazel project itself. It's a bit more advanced than the example I showed earlier of us using Bazel Query, but it's not much more sophisticated than that. Now, this script misses some edge cases, but for our needs, it's good enough. Tinder have made an open source tool that does the same thing, but which is better at catching those edge cases. That means if you wanted to use Bazel in your CI builds, you have a ready pathway to getting the most stable builds you can. I've mentioned that it's possible to run Bazel tests remotely. There are a handful of open source projects that allow you to set up and manage your own distributed build grid. <clears throat> I've been using BuildBarn recently, and it's been great for us at work, but for an open source project, I'm not particularly keen on running the infrastructure required for a Bazel build grid. Given we're at SourceCon, I'm guessing the chances are pretty high that you see the value in someone else providing services for you to distribute the loads of your builds. Fortunately, there are build-as-a-service offerings that are starting to appear. One that I like is called EngFlow, and I have a fork of the Selenium project that can use it. Just as before, we're going to run our tests, but now, rather than running them locally, I'll run them on EngFlow's distributed build grid. It's as simple as adding one more flag to the Bazel command, telling it to use the EngFlow config. Now, one thing this allows us to do is run more tests than I can on my regular machine, because there are hundreds of tests and these can scale horizontally. But the other thing is that we can share work easily. Here's an example of us running the same build, but on different machines. I'm using two separate Docker containers, but you get the idea. This first build is just finishing. I'll uh, let it go. I think it's almost there. And while it does that, I'm going to have some water. Nom, nom, nom. So that first build finished. There were 653 tests that ran. And the host name is something beginning with 48. We're going to cut the, uh, the original command. We're going to flip to a new completely isolated Docker container. This one, zero something or other. We're going to run the same command that we did before. And this is going to fire up a new instance of Bazel. So this is now building the build graph, figuring out like what, it ne what needs to be done. And then it's hitting EngFlow's build grid. This is going a lot faster than it was before. And the reason for that is it's just checking to see whether or not the work has been done. You see, we're already romping through the tests. Oh, I love these things. That large thing that just got built was the uh, React UI, by the way. And you can see here that all the tests are cached. So you're only running the subset of tests that have been affected by a change. And when they run, they parallelize beautifully. Couple this with Source Lab's ability to run hundreds of Selenium tests simultaneously, and you're gonna have wickedly fast and stable builds. But Selenium is a complicated project with lots of languages. Would Bazel be a good fit for you? Well, let's look at the downsides first. Most importantly, there's the learning curve. It's basically vertical. And if you don't have a local expert available, I would hang fire on, on, on Bazel for now. The next rough edge is that writing build files can be hard. Fortunately, 
That's also changing pretty rapidly. There are build file generators for Protobufs, Go, Python, and soon uh, Java. If you're interested in exploring this area, the tool the Bazel community is working with is called Gazelle, and it's well worth a look. Another problem is that pinning everything comes at a cost. Downloading all those toolchains and third-party dependencies can lead to us needing to download hundreds of megabytes of stuff. Downloading the internet is never fun. And while it's downloading, we're not building. Now, this isn't a problem unique to Bazel. Anyone who's used a modern Java or JavaScript build tool will be familiar with that long pause as they download all the required dependencies or do dependency resolution. It's true that Bazel's approach leads to more things being downloaded, but at the end of the day, it's typically a cost we seldom have to pay because we only need to do it once. Now, some toolchains are incredibly quick uh, already, and adopting Bazel for them isn't such an obvious win. <clears throat> But the moment you start needing something to coordinate steps, perhaps if you want to generate some files, then any build tool starts to look more useful. And if your project is going to grow and develop over time, and you're going to use multiple languages, then considering Bazel becomes an option. IDE support for Bazel isn't great. If you're on the happy path of working with Java, C++ or Go, you'll be okay. Once you're off there, it gets less comfortable. Fortunately, the plugins for both IntelliJ and VS Code are both improving and support is getting better with each release of these plugins. And finally, Google uses Linux for almost everything, and there are very few people using Windows there. Bazel is derived from Google's own Blaze build tool, and so it has a strong Unix bias. Now, it works great on Mac OS, but Windows can be a bit of a struggle. If first-class Windows support is something you need, then Bazel isn't for you. Lots of the docs about Bazel talk about how great it is at massive scale, and plenty of the, of the Bazel advocates, myself included, are monorepo fans. But it scales down too. This is largely down to it doing better rebuilds and being able to selectively run subsets of tests. If you have access to a build grid, then the point where build speed improves comes even sooner. Another massive benefit is the simplicity of the shared command line for building, running, and testing. Just knowing that to build something I need to use build and to test something test, it's conceptually simple. And because Bazel does such a good job of caching, I typically just choose to test everything. And one of the nice things about Bazel's build files is they're language agnostic. That means if I can read one, I can figure out how the various parts of a build hang together without needing to have a deep knowledge of how multiple tools work. Again, it makes it easier to work in a polyglot repo. But it also makes it easier to switch between repos in the same company that all use Bazel. If one repo is in Java or Kotlin, another in JavaScript, and another in Go, it's no biggie. As engineering organisations get larger, that ability to move smoothly from repo to repo becomes more important. Because Bazel pins dependencies, there's far less variant between what one developer is using and another. Couple that with being able to build remotely, and you can dramatically reduce the number of cases where something works on my machine, but not someone else's. The number of engineering hours I've seen saved has been incalculable. As you saw earlier, builds are ultimately defined as actions, and these all have inputs and outputs defined. This means that if you have access to a Bazel build grid, you can use it uh, for anything that Bazel supports. You've seen examples of that today when we did distributed builds. So powerful and so useful. And remember, the nice thing is that Bazel is a lot like Selenium, in that if you want to, you can set up and manage your own grid. But if you want to have someone else manage the updates, make sure the latest version of things are available, handle the security updates, <laughs> and ensure the uptime of the system, then there are options. Source Labs are a great option for Selenium, and you've seen how easy it can be to use Bazel as a build, uh, Bazel build service. So, you know the upsides and downsides of Bazel. You've seen it in action. You've seen how we use it in the Selenium tree. Hopefully you're intrigued about using it yourself. The final piece of the puzzle is how to use Bazel in your CI builds. Fortunately, this is relatively simple. If you are using Travis, CircleCI, or GitHub Actions, integrating Bazel into your CI is trivial. The trick to making it work is to allow Bazel to cache downloads between builds. Without that, all the downloading is going to ruin your build times. Once things are set up, if your developers and CI are using the same build grid, then your CI times can be ridiculously fast. After all, before checking in, the developer will have run at least some of the tests, and these will already be ready and waiting for the CI run, which can just use the cached results. On the Selenium project, 
we've definitely found it useful to break the build into pieces, but that's largely because the builders we use for our GitHub actions aren't terribly powerful, and we're doing local builds, so it's more efficient to split things up. If we were using a distributed build grid, then we could modify things so we could do more tests in fewer GitHub actions. It'd be neat to get to that point. So I hope you found this talk interesting and informative. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. I hope there's some time left over for some questions, but if there's something you need to ask, just come and find me on chat or in the Slack, uh, Slack uh, Basil channel. And I'll be happy to help as much as I can. Also, please enjoy the rest of SourceCon. Thank you, folks.